Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I welcome you all to the 22nd Shock Khanum Cancer Symposium. Uh, thank you for joining us on a Sunday afternoon. Um, uh, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Sayyid Atharanam. He needs an, no introduction. Uh, he is a leading researcher, teacher, mentor, and a surgeon par excellence uh, in the neurosurgical fraternity. Uh, professor Anam is a board certified neurosurgeon, professor of neurosurgery, and chair of the Department of Surgery at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi. Uh, he's had a board certification from Canada, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and Glasgow, as well as a fellowship in uh, neurosurgery uh, from USA. He has been awarded several accolades and honors for his work in U.S. and Pakistan, including the Physician of the Year Medallion, uh, Master Surgeon Award, Excellence in Neurosurgery Award, and the Presidential Award, uh, Sitara Imtiaz. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, request uh, Professor Arthur to kindly come up to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Achha, so, so, okay. Yes, Pitani are here. So, you might want to be in a heart. दे दो कोई भी चीज दे दो चाहे कौन सा दे दो माइक पर दे दो अच्छा चलो ठीक है ऑल राइट सो सो थैंक यू वेरी मच सो आई जस्ट दिस टॉक इज अबाउट पाकिस्तान ब्रेन ट्यूमर एपिडेमियोलॉजिकल स्टडी जो के वी कंडक्टेड अ कपल ऑफ इयर्स अगो एंड उसका डाटा जमा करके फिर हमने पब्लिश किया बट लेकिन दे सो मच इंफॉर्मेशन इन दैट स्टडी दैट आई हैव बीन रिपीटिंग इट इन डिफरेंट फोरम्स so that we can uh, use that information to isme jo hai this pakistan society of neuro oncology is an important player in this thing and then pakistan academy of neurological surgery as well this is where i am from ye tasveer itni achhi nahi hogi lag rahi hogi aapko lekin ye maine jahaz se khinchi tasveer jahaz se so as as i was flying you know uh, from uh bali to uh, from dubai to uh, karachi so this is yes, isn't it good picture huh it's very good picture huh? Huh? thank you huh thank you ah kisne kaha ise yaar aap isse behtar khinch ke dikha do shaukat khanam ke manjon mein acha so so this is this is where you know this is this is the juma lab over here and that's the campus ye tower yahan par this is the main hospital and uh, spent 20 years here okay so i usually show these two cases which uh, basically brings the um um the um attention to the problem that we are facing over here this gentleman 63 year old with a gbm i had to let him go back to his home because uske bete ke paas jo paise the wo apne khet bech ke lagata and that would have robbed his whole family of any education and tuition मैंने कहा कि डज नॉट मेक सेंस के इफ यू ऑपरेट एंड ऑल दिस थिंग ऑपरेशन के लिए हम पैसे फिर भी निकाल सकते हैं कि यू से वेलफेयर फंड से बट देन रेडिएशन थेरेपी एंड कीमोथेरेपी विल जस्ट मेक यू टोटली डेस्टिट्यूट एंड यू विल बी अंडर लोन्स फॉर द रेस्ट ऑफ योर लाइफ तो और मैं सिर्फ नौ महीने दे सकूंगा ऑन एवरेज टू योर फादर सो ही अंडरस्टूड दैट पॉइंट वेन बैक फॉर कम्फर्ट केयर अनदर फीमेल अनदर पेशेंट फीमेल she did not follow up with me on a regular basis she was supposed to excellent surgery in the beginning but then she had a big recurrence when she had a seizure and she followed up at that point was too late and she didn't survive either so these are the cases that we have problem what we call as global health problem or global health issue and the and the maha guru and the 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 big guy of global is sitting right here which is uh, professor tarik the global neurosurgery guy so we will be talking more about this thing sir in the uh, upcoming conference in february <clears throat> so anyway those kind of things since i've been back in pakistan has brought me and my attention to the global health issues in pakistan and you know we know that the um, 
So, so whatever is so, so you, you see the numbers we are, we are over here, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And India is going to be up here. Pakistan is going to come up here pretty soon. And we will keep on uh, having problems. Sorry, guys, एक सेकंड से इसका यही काम नहीं करता है अच्छा मैं छोड़ रहे हैं तो यार दे आ जाता हूं सॉरी ओके ऑप्स करो वो क्योंकि आई हैव टू हैव पॉइंट सो वन सो व्हाट वी हैव बीन डूइंग यू नो आप में से मेजॉरिटी ऑफ पीपल हैव बीन एजुकेटेड अब्रॉड आल्सो और आप में से कुछ लोग जाएंगे पढ़ेंगे वी कम बैक एंड वी व्हाटएवर वी लर्न ओवर देयर वी जस्ट ट्राई टू push it as our way of uh, doing as the only way of doing things so we keep on pushing a square peg in a round hole and that's a problem so here are some examples uh, over here where i actually looked into different diseases of neurosurgery and, re and realized that we can improve the outcome by changing it in pakistan setting coming to oncology in the next 15 years or so the tumor the oncology part is going to be major issue in terms of uh, the um, catastrophic uh, expenditure on uh, patients and catastrophic expenditure wo hai jahan par aapke paise aapki jeb se jaate hain and you end up being pushed below the poverty line which does about every year what 100 million individuals are pushed below the poverty line it's unfortunate that we really are not um going to do haven't done anything in the last few years on this issue so the problem is that we don't know the problem and that's why i said know thyself know thy enemy and a thousand battles a thousand victories so looking at the brain tumor aspect if you look at it there are differences in brain tumors this is a middle income country georgia and this is a high income country uh, zurich so there are differences in pathology so you can't just say okay, we will take things from north america cb trust and things like that and do it if you look at the epidemiology pakistan ke epidemiology you know there's no data over here same on over here right we have some data india and bangla and not in bangladesh either so we needed to do that and there is some data that has been correct uh, collected over here which is pakistan atomic energy commission like in the data is very sketchy very little information the uh, there is one from pakistan atomic energy commission which total one year 1550 patients cns tumor ke uh, punjab cancer registry talks about 310 patients and then this is about 550 patients you know in the karachi uh, cancer registry so this is not enough so that's when we decided to um, actually develop a epidemiological study for brain tumor in pakistan no funding zero jahan bhi likha koi paise nahi mile to fir we did it on our own so medical students like you guys you know got together humne fir phone call karke baatein kar kar ke kar kar ke kar kar ke we developed this system so there are about uh, uh, 43 centers usme teen char centers jo hain they backed out they didn't help but we, we picked almost all the centers in pakistan that do neurosurgery for brain tumors the criteria was if they do at least 25 tumors and they have two neurosurgeons working in there so this is what we came up with aur usme about uh, we had uh, this much of private and then rest of the public sector and it was so good to be part of this uh, fraternity or fraternity is a very generous term so that we should not use that it's so good to be part of this neurosurgical community that we came together and tried to build things up so isme agar aap dekhen so we expected some of but then some of these were not up to 25 some of the less than 25 but then majority was from the uh, punjab institute of neuroscience because that has the highest number the reds are the public sector and the blues are the um, private sector so jpmc and pins they were the highest ones and then came the private sectors and then so on and this was all done by this pakistan society of neurology that played a very leading role in it and then pakistan academy of neurosciences we built a pakistan brain tumor consortium that basically worked it and then after all the data was collected from 2019 it was all retrospective data 
uh, we were able to publish it in JPMA. The, demogra the thing that we were looking at was demographics and the course at the hospital. That's what, those were the data, including KPS and things like that. So once we had done, then we started to analyze the data. And uh, I can't go in detail of each one of them. So we don't have enough time. But just to give you an idea that we got about 2,750 uh, data collected for one year, which is uh, higher than any other. And uh, there was a distribution difference that we found in Pakistan compared to other places. But then there were a lot of uh, gaps that we identified. And so this talk is more about those gaps that I want to talk about, that we need to pay attention to those gaps in our care. So one is the socioeconomic status. <clears throat> if you notice that the socioeconomic status is not well represented. So there are a lot of patients in the low socioeconomic status who don't get surgical treatment. They are ignored. That's one thing. The uh, We did not find any issue with, with you know, alcohol, gutka, paan, niswar. Doesn't mean that you start all this. But, you know, we did not find any correlation over there. And the family history, we didn't get anything from this. But the big, the glaring gaps that we found was, one was the radiation therapy. Look at this. 55% of patients, whether they got further treatment after surgery or not, we don't know that. 64% of patients, whether they got chemotherapy after surgery or not, we don't know that. So that's a, that's a big glaring gap. Um, the, if you looked at the age, that was also different. So age at diagnosis in years, the graph is more skewed. So if you look over here, this is something coming into the mid 40s. So it's in an earlier age in our population. Or usme jo hai, if you look at some of the age distribution, uh, um, difficult to probably read on this screen, but you know some of the things have a little earlier age that they show up in our population. Overall, if you compare the PB test and the CB trust, CB trust is the US data <clears throat> and PB test. So if you look at the red versus the blue, so that's the difference in our uh, in our age population in Pakistan on brain tumors. However, one should notice that the distribution of uh, age in USA versus uh, Pakistan is different. You, see, you can see that, you know, we are more younger population and they are more older population. So that's the difference in the, a, in the age distribution of Pakistani population versus a US population. The blue is male and the red is female. Nevertheless, this graph does still go beyond that difference. The overall demographics, when we talk about the age, so we looked at the pediatric and, you know, Dr. Noreen, for your, for your interest, obviously. And then we collected with that. So there's another group that's coming up, emerging in, in a lot of the studies. It's called Young Adult, AYA. So adolescents and young adults. So the, this is the pediatric age. It's less than 15 years in this case. So we have to say 18, 19. It's all just a tug of war. If you look, if you do all this together, 40 years. So this big group of young adults. So you notice there's a big chunk of brain tumors happening in these young adults uh, compared to uh, the Western Western society or the high income countries. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at it, this is a public versus private sector. So there are more children taken care of in public sector versus private sector whereas in the as we as the age goes changes in young adults you know you see more in private sector so 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 there's a gap over here also the children and and you know i will show you in, a, in a later in this uh, talk but then the in public sector they do excellent as compared to private sector except for the pediatric patients so again i'm not going to go into a lot of detail but this shows the age distribution of the different tumors in Pakistan among different ages. And also, you know, in, you know, pediatrics and adolescents, most common blastoma and most common in young adults is glioma and meningioma. So here, if you look at this <clears throat> image, uh, in this, um, you see the alive and deceased, alive and deceased, and this is public and private. So look at this number over here. So there's a big difference in public and private. So that's that's the issue that we we found in pediatric neuro-oncology patients. But then if you compare the public to private, the public do pretty well actually, um, you know, in terms of, uh, there's differences in age distribution, which, which patients go there and, and all that. But if you look over here, 
the the overall uh, alive and deceased is not a whole lot different in in the public versus private sector. Uh, you know, thirteen point nine plus nine point six is pretty much very big here. And loss to follow up, interestingly, is the same in public versus private. About forty percent of patients don't follow up. Now, <clears throat> the issue that was also in Pakistan that we found was the traveling for this brain tumor treatment, and that's it. So there are two things, two main things in global health issue, particularly global surgery. One is affordability, and the other is um, access, right? So access depends on the distance. Pe, paisa bhi padti hai. Affordability is all about money, right? Those are the two major issues. So we looked at the access point of view. In a, um, in a typical high-income country, the access of, for these things is less than 10 kilometers. And the low and middle-income country, it should be, you know, it goes higher up. And there are many papers written on that one for the access issue. But if you look at our data, about 60% uh, of patients had to travel more than 50 kilometers. So that obviously is going to affect the uh, um, follow-up and things like that. And uh, there were about, uh, uh, so we need telemedicine uh, for that purposes. There was, um, there was another graph that showed about 20% actually had to travel more than 500 kilometers. So, and if you look at the access issue, you know, this is the northern areas, Gilgit, Baltistan, they had the most highest, highest problem of uh, traveling and they would travel to private centers uh, that gave them versus public sectors. And uh, if you look at the death, the disease and alive, how access affects it. So you notice that those who traveled more distance, they were more alive because they were in a better shape to travel actually. Uh, Otherwise, those who are in a bad shape, they just go somewhere close by and they and they die. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of data in this thing. And uh, so you can go through the journal if you're interested. So I'm just going to skip all these things. Loss to follow up is another issue. You know, about 40% gets lost to follow up. Uh, by the way, KP, they should be happy about it. Loss to follow up was much better in KPK versus, uh, versus other parts of our country. Um, but... Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, um, there, there are a lot of issues also with that, whether the size of the province and, and it doesn't uh, say anything about the system itself so much. Uh, but uh, there was differences in there. Um, then the other thing that, that came up was this gender bias. So that also was a gap that I found in, in this brain tumor study that the females are not being taken care of as appropriately, most probably. So there's a difference in male and female ratio over here, if you notice that. And uh, if you look at the PB test versus CB trust ratio, so there's the ratio is, the, is, is all skewed towards male. You know, anything above one is, is more male compared to CB trust. So either our biology is different, hai, we have different kind of tumors that happens more in males. Or it's just that ke maybe a female gets a brain tumor and say, you know, pe kuch kara lenge and then just take care of it. So most probably it's that and we need to look into that. Even, even the meningioma, if you look at it, we have 44 to 56 ratio, whereas the uh, international ratio is this one. And then, you know, obviously, how does it affect in public and private versus lower class, middle class and upper class? You see this difference, but then more so in lower class that the males than females versus in, in the middle class. So probably they're ignored, females are ignored more in the lower class. Then we looked at the different kinds of tumors. So gliomas we talked about, again, coming back to this, the highest number of gliomas was in this young adult population. This is when, you know, you're setting up a family and you're doing all the things, then boom, this hits you. Um, interesting thing I showed you about this gap in, in, in adjuvant treatment, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So here you see this, uh, that yes, they did get the radiotherapy, no, they did not get the radiotherapy, no data available. What really bothered me was two things. Grade one should not have received a radiotherapy while it was given. Number two, grade four, which is which should have received radiotherapy, 55% of patients in here also, we don't know what happened to them. Did they get it or not? So it's just like, you know, we surgeons operate and then let them go. That is not right. That is inappropriate. Uh, same thing for chemotherapy that, you know, high grade. And again, over here also for parasitic 
unless Dr. Noreen tells me if pulsating, you can use something like that. So, so if you look at it over here in this, the high grade, so low grade telling maybe the low grades, if it was a very well resected or not, but all the high grades, they have to have radiation therapy and chemotherapy, a big gap over here. And then not given, no. So they actually know that's not given, not given, right? Chemotherapy, not given. So you just operate in the left. So this is a, a major problem. I see that just operate. And that's a lot of misunderstanding, not from the patients only, but from the caregivers as well. Metastasis was another in, interesting eye-opener. So, you know, 20% of lung cancers and other cancers, they end up in metastasizing to the brain. What we found that in our case, about 2.7 or about 3% patients had metastasis overall brain tumors. In general, if you look at it, the, the, the incidence is much higher. Actually, the metastasis to the brain is five times more than the primary brain tumors. They can, most of those metastases are found when the patients are dying. And this, is, this happens more in high income countries because they're getting repeated scans and they are, but over, over here, we at least should see a, some number of that. We did not see that. And not all the patients with metastasis are going to end up with surgery, but about 10 to 20% should end up. So if we, if you look at, if you calculate that number, we should still get about 30%, which is the ratio that we see across the world. What happens? Why are those missing? Either our pathology is different, or Babako ya dada ko ya nani ko jo hai metastasis ho gaya we just forget allah allah karo aur khatam karo usko mamle ko ya phir ye hai ke jo hai we can't afford you know we 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 don't live that long to have metastasis we die early so our overall cancer care is is affected so this was this was a very big gap that i found over here looking at some other different things like for example if you look at ependymoma again one can read that journal but then what bothered me most was this. What bothered most was uh So So, so what we see here is that, you know, CSF diversion only. Why would we do that? I mean, it's a pandemoma. You just, so this is something that we found repeatedly that patients are just shunned, dal diya, ya, work kar diya, and then, and they are, uh, chhod diya unko. So that was a problem. Craniopharyngioma, again, we found a different distribution. You know, Dr. Noreen, for your interest, the bimodal versus over here, we don't see that. And then again, in craniopharyngioma, CSF diversion only, that bothers me a lot. You did not do anything besides that. This was uh, very bothering to me, the time to surgery. So if you look at it, um, grade four, which should be taken care of as soon as possible, that's about 70 days. That's not fair. You know, I mean, seven days, like two, month, two months plus. The patient will, will not be in good shape. Uh, well, meningioma and loss is possible, but that's not that's not uh, that's not right. So, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so what we have to do is we have to look at things in prospective terms. Um, you know, Mirsa, a bit of problem jo, that I found. Ke if we go on to the so the so the higher um, so in the in the uh, higher higher um, income countries, it's about nine point nine per hundred thousand. In the lower income countries, data hai, that's about 5.1 per thousand incidence of 100,000 incidence of brain tumors. So by that analysis, uh, by that analysis, we can, by that analysis, we can, but then we only found, only found 2,750. It's so about 24, about one fourth. Where did what happened to the rest of three fourth? Now there were few centers that did not participate. They they chickened out one of the CMH, you know, Hamara data agar chala jayega, to log daatenge, ye karenge, wo karenge. So uh, can can work with them. Okay. So but then you know, so twenty percent jo hai, we add to that. Agar hum extrapolate karte hain, still we are missing about two third of them. So two third of the patients ya to hamare brain tumors hi kam hai hamare Pakistan mein. Two-third of patients are just not being taken care of appropriately. That's my problem. 
So, so what we, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, that, a true leader, you know? Okay, all right, thank you. The true, the true team of leaders, the true team of leaders. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to move forward this is pb test we need to go into prospective data collection iske liye mere paise jama karne padenge paise jama nahi ho rahe hain jahan bhi bhejta hu grant ke liye get gets rejected uh, you know i you know but i'm still scrambling and trying to get some and then we need to go into health economics and look into those things anyway the answer is that eventually we need to know that you know the art of war this is a good book i tried to leaf through it several times uh, library mein hai ye, but you know you can leave only so much you can't read the whole book but still it's a nice book to read a lot of things by Sun Tzu and this is the team uh, that we had um, I'm sorry this is the team of the medical students and some of the residents and all those people that helped in this in this process so thank you very much thank you professor for your excellent talk and certainly it's an eye-opener of the gaps we have in terms of uh, identifying patients with brain tumors and then treating them uh, to a world standard. Uh, certainly we are taking the right steps and inshallah we will be there once we have all the data. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, huh. Uh, the performance status of patient uh, actually dictates whether he gets radiotherapy or not. Some of these patients are so ill that their performance status is ECOG4. That uh, giving radiotherapy to those patients may be one of the reasons why they never had any radiation. Right. So there was a group that, if you notice, that, that showed they did not receive it. But I'm concerned about we don't know if they got it or not. That was 55 to 60%. So, and that's a big number though. And even if they did not get radiotherapy, they could have still gotten chemotherapy, but then they're so expensive. And even PCV is a problem because you have to do multiple tests. So, chemozolomide is not PCV. But it's the gap that I was most concerned about, not that they did not get it. Yeah, your point is taken as such. Uh, but uh, I was just trying to I come agree up with, with an explanation of G, some G, 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 G. Okay, If the patient is very ill, and usually because we see such a large number of these patients in our department mm -hmm. who are operated outside and by the time they come to us, they're almost terminally ill. So mm -hmm. for a terminally ill, uh, supportive care uh, is a fairly reasonable option. Indeed. And uh, that may have been, but as you said before, uh, probably it wouldn't count for all those patients. Right. Okay. But that would count for no, but not unknown. So no, unknown ke kaur, masla ye ke surgeons operate and then amara kaam ho gaya, khalas, you take care of them. I'm not responsible. That's a bad attitude, which which uh, I'm a surgeon, so I'm saying that. I can say that. You can't say that. So that's a bad attitude. Ke, you know, you, you operate and let go. You can't. You have to follow up the patients. You have to see kya hai, whether they're being treated or not. I love the surgeons for the very fact every time they operate, they say that. But everything has been cleared up. Just go to the radiation oncologist. <laughs> okay. He will sort it out and he will also do the follow-up. So no reason. You never know what happened to them. Uh, that's why he's laughing. <laughs> just just, just uh. comment. Uh, like, it's probably it's not as important in hybrid gliomas. But if you talk about, in general, the malignant brain tumors, so it's very, very important in cases of medulloblastomas um, and in, even in low brain tumors. So the, the point is, there is essentially no follow-ups. Like once a surgeon operated, he just lost a follow-up. Or what happens when we are seeing in other centers of Pakistan, surgery is done, surgery is done, and he has told him that he will go to radiation, he has told him that he will go to the MRI spine, I'm talking about medulloblastoma. So uh, then what happened, that when he goes to radiation or to the oncologist, he has the same disease which is out from the West, 90%, we have 30%. So these are something in which we have to intervene, we have to develop collaborations between centers, we have to develop tumor boards because tumor boards are not good. Okay, we are saying that we don't have to give it, we don't have to give it. But then we need to discuss it among, uh, among some us. sort of a tumor board. Right. 
सो विदाउट दैट आई थिंक इट्स इट्स नॉट हेल्पफुल कि हम उसको ना दें या दें यू नो इवन देर आर किड्स who survive like for four years and adults young adults who survive like five to six years and even in glioblastoma so it's thank just you. a matter of yeah. thank, thank you professor adil nam uh, really an excellent uh, talk an excellent collection of data on global neuro oncology um i think a lot needs to be done i think it's not that we don't have the disease we certainly have it more than them unfortunately there is no data collection and i think you're going in the right direction um just one little point you had mentioned the distance that some people had to travel 50 kilometers or more i think maybe next time you would like to look at the time rather than the distance because 50 kilometers in a in a mountainous area uh, can mean even two, three be, days but, or yeah, something like that we'll, we'll, but uh, really a great effort thank you thank you thank you uh, i think can i ask you please have you noticed the difference in ke un centers mein jahan surgery or radiation dono maujood hain वहां पे द डेटा वाज नॉट एज बैड एज यहां पे सिर्फ न्यूरो सर्जरी हो और साथ रेडिएशन ना हो मतलब एट वन साइड जस्ट लाइक यू यू और एसकेएम और नॉर्थ वेस्ट और समथिंग लाइक जी सो लुक्ड इनटू आई लुक्ड इनटू दैट आल्सो आई कुड नॉट फाइंड एनी स्ट्रांग कोरिलेशन एंड सो दैट मेड मी थिंक इट्स नॉट द फैसिलिटीज प्रॉब्लम इट्स द सर्जंस प्रॉब्लम दैट दे आर नॉट रियली टेलिंग देयर पेशेंट दैट दे हैव टू फॉलो अप विद दैट and then somebody has to follow i have lost a lot of patients like that uh, because uh, nobody called them up again we do tumor board we do call them up and tell them this is karwana hai lekin uske baad usko follow up koi nahi kar raha hai fir baad mein wo aaye 3 saal baad wo khatun jaise thi ke we you know ab tumor dobara aa gaya so we we don't have a navigator and we need to have strong navigators who can then call them up so many system read up karne ki koshish ki thi but then you know we don't have enough uh, um, manpower to do that so we you should have a system where every patient should be called and that's where we need we need to go into telehealth with this app and everything which will tell us ke kon kon patients aapke follow up ho rahe hain kon kon nahi ho rahe hain we need to build that up thank you for asking that question okay thank you bahut shukriya uh, thank you very much professor our, our next speaker is uh, dr uh, norin mushtaq uh, she is an associate professor in pediatric neuro oncologist from Aga Khan University Hospital Karachi uh she embarked on this uh, difficult journey and um, after having a excellent twinning initiative with the Hospital of Sick Children Toronto uh she developed the first uh National Pediatric Brain Tumor Board and established the Pediatric Neuro Oncology uh, 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 uh service at Aga Khan University Hospital So I uh, invite her to speak on the advances in the management of uh, medulloblastoma. Assalamu alaikum. So thank you so much Dr. Irfan for your uh, kind invitation and kind uh, introduction. So uh, the topic of my talk today is the updates in the management of the medulloblastoma. So I have no conflict of interest and no disclosures. So we all know um, that medulloblastoma are undifferentiated small round blue cell tumor. They are WHO grade four tumors. They basically arises from the pluripotent cerebellar neuroectodermal cells. Many of my colleagues thought that it's the most common brain tumors in pediatric age group, but it's not actually. The most common primary brain tumors are still the low grade gliomas. But yes, it is the most common malignant tumors and accounts of about twenty percent of all the primary. tumors and i'm talking about the age group from 0 to 18 um and uh, among them 30% 25 to 30% do metastasize so it's always essential that we all know that to stage a medulloblastoma whenever you consider or make a diagnosis on the basis of scan or anything please do make an effort uh, to have an mri whole spine with contrast before surgery ideally but if not possible within 72 hours post operatively it's very very important for us oncologists and for our radiation oncologists to make a proper and timely plan of these patients so pathologically or morphologically so uh, for the like the older classification classified medullo as four subgroups which includes the classic medulloblastoma the round blue cells it's account for 70 to 80% of the total uh, percentage while the other one is dysplastic nodular more common in young children and adults then medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity exclusively present in infants with a very good outcome of more than 80% uh, 
anaplastic enlarges with it usually associated with the p53 mutant tumors in different age groups so this is the risk stratification so medulloblastoma is risk stratified and this is an older one, but still a very, very relevant in our part of the world. And many people are still using this uh, because we don't have the capacity for the molecular subgroups. So it's classified into average risk and poor risk. So in the average risk, uh, if, if the tumor is localized in the cerebellum, children are more than three years of age, near a gross total resection or a near total resection, and they are in the posterior fossa, and if they have the classic and the desmoplastic nodular pathology comes in the average risk group, while the other include the one with the disseminated disease, children less than three years of age underwent partial resection or a biopsy, or uh, previously um, uh, the tumors which are outside the posterior fossa comes in the category of poor risk, but now it has completely wiped out and they go to the other embryonal uh, category in the 2017 and 2021 uh, WHO classification. So it's not in this anymore. And the one with the large cell or anaplastic, they comes in the porous groups. So this is an old paper. I really like. Uh, you can you can uh, uh, you know see the histology uh, like history way back in 1925 by two of the neurosurgeons, Dr. Bailey and Cushing, who once had this paper and what they have found out that out of the all intracranial tumor, they have found out about 40 percent are the one which are primarily arising from the brain. And initially, they thought that all of them were gliomas. But later on, uh, they found that all of these gliomas, there are some gliomas which do favorable with the help of resection and some kind of radiation. So this will lead, this then lead to um, an, uh, like the attempt for the X-ray therapy in 1930 by the same group. And they have found out that on autopsy, there is no evidence of the disease in those patients. So there the comes the uh, you know treatment of the medulloblastoma. And first, uh, it was given by Edith and Peterson. And this paper was from 1953. And what they have found out that they have given these x-rays and their outcome is 60% in most of their patients. And it's more than uh, even in after five years of treatment. And this is the you know uh, machine they have used at that time. So. Um, in the end, the medulloblastoma active treatment include not only surgery, but craniospinal radiation uh, and uh, post-radiation um, uh, chemotherapy, which includes different uh, combination, platinum compounds, CCNU, cyclo, and all of them leads to the outcome from 40% in 1972 up to 80% in the average risk medulloblastoma patient. But what about the high-risk medulloblastoma patient? So the lessons we had learned at that point in time was that we should have an MRI to know and the CSF cytology to know why either we have a metastatic disease or not. The problems with the surgery that we have to, you know, make an effort to decrease the percentage of mutism in our patients and improve the outcome because all of this will improve the outcomes. Then the quality, field reduction, dose reduction in smaller kids, appropriate and timely maintenance chemotherapy and follow-ups in these patients. So these, these are some papers which tells us that, you know, there's a significant risk of cerebellum aortism post medulloblastoma. So this is a West data uh, and it shows that 25% of the children with average risk medulloblastoma may have cerebellum aortism after surgical resection. And not only this, these children may have problems related to uh, the radiation and the chemotherapy. They may have early aging in adult survivals of medulloblastoma, long-term neurocognitive, functional, and physical outcomes, not only because of the tumor itself, but the management also. So, um, uh, and then further, so, so when we thought about, so this is all about an average risk, but what to do with others' medulloblastoma? So, we have to think about the reduced uh, mortality and we may need for more effective regimens, reduce morbidity to improve the dose of radiation and modify chemotherapy, and to improve our knowledge, uh, increase the understanding of the disease biology. And this will help us in various studies. And you know, after 2010, it was a dearth of, it was like a massive bombardment of various papers of uh, molecular subgroups. And the biological studies include tumor tissues, CSF markers, and genome. And if you see this, this is a, like, I just love this picture. This is a, a magic consortium, medulloblastoma, advanced genomic international consortium. And in that con consortium, back in 2010, 
uh, many uh, uh, of my colleagues and seniors and mentors have uh, set together from 45 Center, they have collected more than 1,200 samples of medulloblastoma. And what they have uh, identified is that the molecular subgroup, the, the medulloblastoma is divided into four molecular subgroups. This paper was uh, published in 2010, 11 by Paul Northcott and Michael Taylor. Paul uh, is a pediatric neuro-oncologist. Michael Taylor is a pediatric neurosurgeon. So at that time, what the small information they have is that it is associated with different age groups. This is all they knew at that point in time. But then the next year, another paper by Michael Taylor and the same group came, which then changed the, the whole scenario. And then they decided that Brint, Sonic Hedgehog, Group 3 and Group 4 are replaced. Like initially they were Group C and Group D, and now it's Group 3 and Group 4. So they, they have different demographic, different clinical features, different genetics, therefore different outcomes. So then uh, after two years, uh, they basically characterized that these cytogenetic prognostication in basically like different subgroups have different cyto cy cytogenetic pro prognostication. Therefore, they have decided to incorporate these prognostication in the newer risk stratification. So this paper in 2016 by one of my colleague Vijay. So he combined all the information um, in 2015 uh, meeting, and then the, the consortium decided that medulloblastoma now risk, risk stratified on the basis of molecular subgroup as low risk, average risk, high risk, and very high risk. This is a good, um, an excellent picture. If you see um, that the low risk are only two, and the wind has the best. Um, outcome. So children who have been uh, less than 16 years of age have an outcome of more than 90%. Um, and the children with group 4 has an outcome of more than uh, 90% if they have chromosome 11 loss. Then children who are TP53 wild type, no MIC amplification, group 3 without metastatic disease, and group 4 with no chromosome 11 loss comes in the standard risk group. The high risk group includes the sonic hedgehog with the metastatic uh, potential and MIC amplification and group 4 with metastatic disease. Very high risk is the one with TP53 mutant tumor, either metastatic or non-metastatic, and group 3 with metastatic disease. And the outcome is less than 50%. So even in our setup, we have few cases of TP53 mutant tumor, and our outcome is almost zero. So then um, it further classified into 12 subgroups. And you know I don't want to go in detail because these subgroups are associated with different prognostication and different age groups. So many a time, my colleagues have asked me, so what to do in our settings? So um, we don't have the nano string. We don't have the methylation assays. We are trying to develop these kind of things in our part of the uh, world or different institute. But you know, um, this is a great paper by Sebastian Perrault and published in 2014. And if you see this diagram, you can easily identify different areas and sites of medulloblastoma. So if you see the first one, so usually this wind subgroup uh, are present at the, uh, at the cerebellopontine angles. The um, uh, sonic hedgehog are the one which usually present in the cerebellar hemisphere. The group three and four are usually present in the fourth ventricles, and group three are the one which has a hyper intensity, and group four is high iso to hypo intense uh, in the fourth ventricle. So you know you can um, identify these markers. It's it's a crude method, so you know you can tell us that okay, your your patient has these kind of molecular subgroups. So this is a small data of our patients. So. Um, from 2015 till 2022, we have sent our patient to sick kids uh, uh, to do the molecular subgroups. And most of our patient comes in the category of group four. And the lowest number is um, the sonic hedgehog TP3 mutant. And the outcome is extreme. And it's, it's very poor. All of them died. So this that was all about the pediatric. But this is like uh, the adult medulloblastoma. So very, very few papers for the adult medulloblastoma. This paper. Uh, for the subgroup and subtypes of adult medulloblastoma came from a pediatric group. So one of my colleague, Haley Colton, um, and the sick kids group are the one who basically write this paper. And what they found out that it's almost the same than these patients. So they, um, the, this, uh, the uh, most common um, subgroup in the adult is group three. So your diagram is probably bad. 
And if you see the outcomes in these patients, so there are some other association like 17P loss, 10Q loss, and chromosome 8, 8 loss is present in adults, which are not present in the pediatric age group. And their outcomes is slightly poorer if you compare it with the uh, pediatric counterparts. So these are the European guidelines for managing uh, adults. So it's almost the same that you have to do uh, an MRI, an MRI whole spine, achieve GTR. You have to discuss every patient in the tumor boards and then decide either you have to risk stratify them in the intermediate risk or a high risk group. And then if they relapse, you again go for a GTR and then uh, do radiation or chemotherapy. So what to do in, if you have a medulloblastoma in LMIC? So, you know, this is this picture um, is from Jordan. They have started this twinning initiative back in 2002 with the Hospital for Sick Children and their outcome of medulloblastoma at that time improves from 40% to 70%. So this is a lot. And then, you know, they have done multiple things with the help of twinning initiative, like a uh, twinning initiative in a developing country with a developed country. So various things have we done after that. And in Pakistan, we have done the same back in 2014, as Dr. Irfan has said, that we have started our tuning initiative from 2014 till date. We have discussed uh, more than 500 cases in our tumor boards with many blast uh, medulloblastoma, not only from AKU, but from Indus and others hospital also. Not only this, afterwards from 2019, we have started national tuning initiative from 13 different uh, centers of Pakistan, which includes JPMC, um, Indus, um, uh, Children Hospital Lahore, Multan, CMH Pindi, PIMS, uh, Northwest Health Hospital, and many other centers. And, you know, they are presenting their cases in our national tumor boards. We are having four tumor boards per month, uh, which are national. And till date, we have discussed more than 400 cases in these tumor boards. Not only this, we have established guidelines for the management of medulloblastoma of children more than three years of age, including the average, average risk and the high-risk group. So, you know, just a small step to standardize treatment protocols in children of medulloblastoma. So this is a very good diagram to show us the history and the treatment evolution of medulloblastoma starting from 1926 um, to uh, 1953, the initiation of radiation, then the initiation of chemotherapy, followed by the molecular subgroups, and then um, the targeted therapy. So in the end, um, there are some take-home message for all of you. Um, so one is MRI spine should be done uh, before surgery. If not done, should be done within 72 hours post uh, resection. Treatment is age-dependent. Treatment is stage-dependent um, as there are two types, high-risk and average-risk medulloblastoma. Treatment should be, should be multidisciplinary. Um, staging should be done with the help of your neurosurgeons, radiologists, pathologists, and everybody Timings of the radiation is extremely important. And uh, one of them said, very rightly said, that if you have a center in your center, yes, of course, it helps to improve uh, the, the time duration and the outcome of these patients. So our outcomes or indus outcomes are far better than the outcomes maybe in other centers who don't have the multidisciplinary teams. So timing of the chemotherapy, timing and the ponsi um, uh, that is extremely, extremely important. And the molecular characterization, it's, it is essential for all of us, but you know, it is not replacing anything. Um, the, the most important factors are good surgery, timely incorporation of radiation and chemotherapy and follow-ups. So this, with this, I just want to invite all of them to Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology fourth uh, symposium, uh, uh, which will be held on 1st to uh, 3rd December in Karachi. It's bridging the gap in the management of pediatric brain tumors in LMIC. Um, thank you so much. This is a great diagram. This is a great picture of all my colleagues, friends, mentors who have helped us a lot. And without them, this whole activity is not possible. Thank you, Dr. Noring. Uh, goes to show. Uh, how much effort one has to put in to take a little step forward, but each step counts a lot. And thank you very much for your excellent talk. Any questions? Uh, 
the doses which we use for radiation, uh, they have remained more or less unchanged now almost for four decades as such. Do you see in future that happening or if there's anything going on in that direction? It's protocols uh, going on in St. Jude's and sick kids in which they have reduced the dose to 18 gray, 18 gray instead of 23.4. But you know, they are still in the process and uh, what they have started, they have started giving um, uh, bone marrow transplant, they're, doing, they're replacing radiation and doing bone marrow transplant. But you know, in our part of the world, it's, it's not possible. The other thing which we can do is once we have started this uh, subgrouping in our patients, we can at that time decrease the dose in our patient. But with, without that, it's really, really impossible to decrease the dose because then the relapses will happen, what will we do? We will do anything. We will do anything. We will do anything. So uh, the intrathecal medications, they are more important in the infantile age groups. So uh, the children who are less than three years of age, we usually give them a uh, different protocol with high-dose methotrexate and intra-omaya uh, or intraventricular chemotherapy in those patients, not in the children who are more than three, so three years of age. So this is all about more than three years of age. I think probably there is to move forward. Yes. And then there are various targeted therapy coming. and which there are Vismodage, uh, Sonic Hedgehog, uh, Ki Targeted Therapy, hai, Wind Ki. Hai. So people are using, starting using them, but they are still processed. Obviously, I think mean, I work with very credible research. Yes, these are rare tumors, and they help to be for treating the pain. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noreen. I just want to uh, commend you and thank you for your hard work on developing the National Tumor Board. I think it's been very helpful for our hospital, Northwest, and our group of uh, surgeons and oncologists, really. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Azar Rashid. He's a radiation oncologist with a special interest in uh, neuro-oncology. He currently practices at the Neurospinal and Cancer Care Institute in Karachi. Uh, he is a fellowship in radiation oncology from the College of Physician Surgeons, Pakistan, and an MSc in oncology from Nottingham University. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, uh, Chairman, Co-Chair, uh, organizers, and ladies and gentlemen for giving me opportunity to speak about SRS in uh, brain metastasis. Uh, I am primarily a radiation oncologist doing a radiosurgical program in Neurospinal Cancer Care Institute, Karachi. Uh, these are disclosures. Uh, regarding the general overview of brain metastasis, 9 to 17% common intracranial tumor, 10 times more frequent than primary brain tumors, 20 to 40% of the adult with cancer, uh, they, they do have uh, uh, metastasis at some point in time in their treatment uh, paradigm. A, a better cancer control actually results into more brain metastasis over the period of time, as we have uh, better options of the treatment as well. Most common pathologies are breast, lung, melanoma, colorectal, and renal cell carcinoma. Uh, most common location in brain is cerebral hemisphere 80% of the time, cerebellum is 15%, and brainstem is on 5%. Gray and white matter junction is the most probable site of uh, brain metastasis, probably because of the narrow caliber blood vessels tends to trap tumor emboli. 70% are multiple brain metastasis rather than a single isolated mat. The best diagnostic tool is contrast enhanced MRI. The radiation therapy in terms of uh, WBRT, which is a whole brain radiotherapy, and uh, SRS, which is a stereotactic localized targeted precision radiotherapy, and uh, that has been the mainstay of the treatment in solid malignancies. Uh, SRS actually is one of the important part for all these kind of managements in which the survival actually improved from WBRT less than six months and addition of SRS actually resulted into a better uh, survival more than six months on an average like eight to 16 months. So stereotactic radiotherapy is the, uh, is the primary uh, plan for me to speak about it in brain metastasis. Uh, it is introduction simply is actually a targeted focused radiotherapy uh, delivery to the targeted one single or multiple targets with the help of the stereotactic frame and giving an ionizing 
uh, pathway, which actually goes not only in the DNA damage, as well as along with the DNA damage, having a cellular pathways, like uh, uh, we have uh, a kind of uh, uh, single and double standard breaks in the DNA, which is a direct injury. And over that, we have a cellular pathways, different types of cell uh, type, uh, cellular type uh, reactions, they are occurring. Either it's apoptosis, the vascular phenomena, and anti-angiogenic pathway, or it is actually characterizing in this term that the frame gives you the localization and the highest dose of radiotherapy within the target that getting into the uh, 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 tumor. This is the person who is Lars Lexel, uh, the primary player, in, uh, the neurosurgeon uh, in Sweden. He actually went for this kind of combination of the stereotactic frame and radiotherapy delivery because he has been doing a kind of uh, biopsies and uh, other things with the help of the frame. And he used the radiotherapy or radiation tool as one of the targeting uh, treatment uh, tool uh, with the help of the frame. And uh, the gamma knife actually the primary hub for the radio surgery. The development of the gamma knife units was something like this. This was a proto unit 1950. It was invented, and over a period of time, we have seen that the development of the imaging that was actually the primary base for the development of the these models of the gamma knife. So we do have a kind of four uh, C model perfection and then icon. And this uh, development of uh, uh, the tool was very important in terms of uh, this cone beam CT over the tool. So that that is the actually the changing era. From here, it was went through the manual uh, delivery of radiotherapy to the automatic delivery that reduces the time of treatment. And from here to here, we have got a multi-session targeting of the brain tumors. So here, the gamma knife model was changed all the way with the kind of idea that it is a frame-based and you can just do the treatment with single fraction. But over here, we have the capacity to treat the larger brain lesions or the deep brain lesions with the help of the multi-session with multiple fraction as we are doing in the radiation oncology with the help of the thermoplastic sheet. And this is a Linux based radio surgery. This gentleman is a neurosurgeon again and was a part of the team of the Lars Lexer and he's uh, John Edler. He was actually the inventor of uh, cyber knife and three cyber knife, four cyber knives are available in Pakistan nowadays. And uh, after this, the, uh, the gantry based, the fixed gantry based Linux, they were become the very popular tool for the radio surgery because it actually carries the most significant part in terms of catering the multiple pathologies and different types of radiation fields in the clinic. So this can work like a working horse that it is a, it is a kind of radio surgical tool that treats all the way the larger uh, treatment field as well as the very targeted smaller part in comparison with the uh, kind of uh, cyber knife. If we just see as a, as an expert that what tool you need to understand for the catering the larger number of the patients, the gantry based, linux based stereotactic radiotherapy tool is actually preferred over the robotic tools at this point in time in our part of the world. Uh, these are the units actually uh, kept with in our in my hospital, neurospinal cancer care. We have two linux uh, linear accelerators and one gamma knife, and these are backed up with the uh, kind of uh, MRI and CT scanners and PET CT scan as well. SRS in brain metastasis is actually uh, moved along with the kind of experience and then getting into the trials and then evolved the primary baseline parameters to do the sur uh, surgery with then evidence. So this is, this is one uh, part of the thing that you see that 90, 94% of the breast cancer uh, they are uh, they are having th these these metastases from the breast cancer having 94% control rate with SRS. So this was actually shown with this trial, which is very 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 old trial now. is one of the landmark trial for radiosurgical people to select the patient for radiosurgery. And over the period of time, the pathology based uh, information that evolved that uh, different pathologies have different type of control in the brain with the help of SRS. The doses which we are using, this is again based upon the same trial. The kind of uh, size was taken as one model to understand that if you are having a smaller size, you can give the larger doses, while increasing size usually required to reduce the doses. So this is a conventional relationship between the dose and volume. So one need to understand then when you have two or less than two centimeter diameter of the mat, you can treat with 24 gray single fraction. 
And if you have more than two and one point, uh, uh, less than three centimeter, 18 gray, and 3.1 or four centimeter, 15 gray. But now we are actually having a multi-session on gamma knife as well as on the Linux and cyber knife. We used to treat these the kind of uh, larger lesions on a multi-session, which is very safe and generally speaking, very well tolerated. The radiobiology, generally, I just pull up a few points on it. That the larger dose of the radiotherapy, 20 grain single fraction, in comparison, when we are giving 30 grain 10 fractions or 20 grain 5 fractions, this large dose actually carries some significant cellular pathways to, to, to move on, particularly the ASF sphingomyelinase pathway. And giving a kind of dose, which is actually beyond 8 gray, is activate tumor endothelial cells, apoptosis, disrupt tumor vasculature, and increases tumor cell death. And simultaneously, the release of tumor-specific antigen that leading to the priming of CD8 T cells and subsequently immune-mediated responses may further enhance. And naturally, at this point in time, we know the abscopal effect as well, the immuno immunotherapies with, along with us. So this is a combo situation nowadays that the immunotherapy with the help of the targeted treatment along with the targeted radiotherapy is probably now and the future of the uh, treatment of the management of the uh, metastasis. The specific radiotherapy part of the planning is conformity and the selectivity. Selectivity is actually a follow-up of the dose. We just see there's more of the interest of a radiation oncologist that if we see this is a low conformity, the conformity means the peripheral dose distribution is actually not that much aligned to the peripheral part of the tumor and having a wider spread of the low doses. While over here, we can see that the very good conformity and very well selectivity is there. So this is the art of the planning. When you start treating and when you start planning on the gamma knife console, you have all these kind of things to move on with the gross and fine tuning of the plan to get these kind of conformities and selectivities. The different type of uh, treatment planning, few isocenter, larger collimeters. You just made a very small plan with the kind of 30 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minute treatment only. And you can have a, a huge follow-ups along with that. This is red area is actually collimeters, which is actually lying far out of the tumor. But over here, we have multiple small isocenter, multiple isocenters, small collimeters. This will be a very good plan, having a very good conformity as well as selectivity, but it will probably take a longer time to execute. Otherwise, time also dependent upon the radioactivity of the uh, cobalt 60, which is actually lying into the unit. So this is how we need to understand that the planning also makes the difference for the selectivity and conformity. Brainstem lesion, you can have a smaller uh, collimeters to use and yellow is actually a prescription line over here. So deep brain lesions can be treated very well, can be treated with radio surgical part, but planning actually requires more skill. The cystic lesions can only be treated like the wall enhancement. You can just place your uh, isocenters in this way, multiple isocenters just covering the uh, peripheral part of the tumor. The prognostic system, this is important for radiosurgical selection of the patient. The factors we usually historically have been seen that since long we are uh, seeing that uh, the performance status, primary control of the uh, tumor, age less than 60 or more than 60, only brain metastasis or other metastasis are for. So this RPA was the primary player for prognostication and usually as the part to select the patient for SRS. Afterwards, after RPA, this score was very uh, popular, prognostic score too. And this was actually added up with the largest lesion size and number of lesions too. So few factors were added up and then radiosurgical score was calculated and the survival was uh, estimated before the selection of the patient. It was replaced with some other tools, which was another one, GPA, which was a graded prognostic analysis or graded prognostic assessment. And that adds a few factors over here, along with KPS. It was added up with the largest tumor volume and number of tumors. And that was translating in a different kind of classes and different kind of prognosis. After this, we feel like the mutational status becomes a more important for the primary tumor. So these mutational status was used for the specific histology, specific pathology. So prognostic uh, status, gene status was added up and we can see that the prognosis that actually rise up up to 40 months. And then we usually see that uh, the melanoma is seen like up to uh, 34 months. So this was how the prognostic changes were came into the with the little information and the better selection of the patient. The radiosurgery becomes the better tool to increase the survivals. 
This is specific for breast cancer. Three factors, Karnofsky's profoundness status, subtype of breast cancer, and age. So this is actually going to make a classification like this, and the survival is going up to 24, 25 months. Now the radio surgery for brain metastasis usually classifies as one to four metastasis, five or 10 uh, metastasis or more than that. So as uh, NCCN is classifying them, I'm just using the same type of classification, but the radiosurgical community treating all the metastases with the kind of volume-based radiosurgery nowadays. So they are not that, that much of the kind that they will just see the number of lesions. The number and the volume is actually a primary player in terms of volume of the tumor. It's not the number of the tumor, which is important for the radiosurgical application. But generally, NCCN is um, making it in this way. And many other guidelines, they are actually supposed to make it like when to use the radiosurgery. So they are actually classifying it for the better outcome of the radiosurgery. So over here, we can see the disseminated systemic disease with poor systemic performances. SRS is actually a second option. So WBRT is the, on the first option, even for the limited brain metastasis. And over here, when we see the new diagnosis, stable systemic disease, reasonable systemic treatment options, and SRS is on the number one. So this is important to understand. The selection actually is not the only number or the performance or the prognostic indicators. It still requires the treatment options and systemic disease status. This is a historical trial that actually adds up whole brain radiotherapy in the management of uh, brain metastasis after surgery. And this, uh, uh, Pachel et al. is a very famous trial, the baseline trial for the uh, radiation addition as a whole brain radiotherapy with the surgery. And it was reducing the 70% of the recurrences, but not affecting the uh, survival. But that actually uh, vitalizes the radiotherapy role in brain metastasis. And this is another trial which was showing what the whole brain radiotherapy efficacy does. When you are going only whole brain, probably is not making much. With radio, with surgery and whole brain radiotherapy, we are having relatively a better outcomes. But radiotherapy with hippocampal sparing and momentum will remain be the uh, uh, standard for care. This is what SRS versus microsurgery that you'll go for the surgery or SRS. A many trials, a very old trial, and the new meta analysis have or uh, the coming up has shown that the SRS alone is not inferior to the open surgery, that is microsurgery. So that is important to understand. No difference in survival between surgery plus SRS versus SRS alone. Instead, they find out the surgical patients, they were having a more local recurrences uh, when they went into the microsurgery. So usually the trend is moving towards the SRS alone. So in the limited brain metastasis. So if I just conclude for this uh, limited brain metastasis, one to four brain metastasis, we need to understand the four, or, uh, four centimeter or less in diameter. The better local control with and exclusive radiotherapy is better instead of surgery. And there is no difference in survival. Patient selection for surgery will remain an important part because surgery is important in those cases where you really feel like a midline uh, shift is there. You have a larger lesion and you are unable to actually give the radiotherapy in terms of development of the edema. You need to go for the surgery at that point in time. And this is uh, how the paradigm moves on. Uh, this is all what I have already told you. Now the radio surgery for five or more than uh, five brain metastasis. WBRT plus SRS boost RTOG 9508 is important trial for this. And that showed the, uh, the better survival advantage in 6.5 versus 4.9 months. And we really feel like that the Japanese, they are working a lot of uh, uh, on radio surgery alone. The gentleman Yamamoto is more of the a radiosurgical a neurosurgeon who used to have the uh, uh, single gamma knife or multiple session of the gamma knife instead of whole brain radiotherapy. And it actually tells us that the addition of the SRS uh, improves the KPS and reduce the steroid dose, while WBRT after SRS has not been shown any benefit. It will be actually the current uh, recommendation I will pull up in the end. This is extensive brain metastasis on NCC and how they feel like that extensive brain metastasis. Still, you need to understand that after having a radiologic diagnosis of the brain metastasis, you need to see that biopsy is possible or not. And then you move forward with the kind of situation that if you have the multiple lesions not amenable to surgery and you are not required tissue diagnosis, you can move with the uh, whole brain radiotherapy with hippocampal sparing and momentum use. 
or the otherwise SRS is another option. But if you see that uh, SRS can be considered for patient with good performance and low tumor burden, this will remain one of the selection criteria. Yes, you need to choose on that if you are having multiple brain metastasis, but the volume is low, which is usually less than 15 cc, you can go for the SRS alone. And these are the various studies showing the benefit of SRS alone over the whole brain radiotherapy in multiple brain metastasis. Repeat radio surgery. This is an enter very important part of radio surgery when we are usually using the single fraction or multiple session on a one limited uh, uh, brain metastasis. We used to have these kind of uh, recurrences when and how we can choose the patients for the repeat radio surgery. The key points are decision to treat, the efficacy and toxicity of repeat radio surgery, complications, that is radio radiation necrosis and its management, uh, our cases and the summary. So the diagnosis of recurrence. So, uh, we're running over time. Yes, I'll finish now. Okay, so. The diagnosis of uh, the recurrence is most important that you need to understand the biopsy is the gold standard for that. But still, you need to have the level one evidence to understand that recurrence is there. But these are the imaging follow-ups that we can just see the high resolution MRI. Uh, the studies with T1, T2 contrast uh, overlapping and the other thing that can actually, with the help of the radiologist, MRS, PET, PET, CT scan, ADC, and DWI, that can help you to tell you the recurrence, and you can just treat it with the uh, second repeat radio surgery. So quickly, I will just move forward with the, this, the, the backup of the repeat radio surgery literature is full. After whole brain radiotherapy, the repeat radio surgery is very easy, and you can move forward every time. But after SRS, the same region, that is only a challenging situation to understand. So at this point in time, radiation necrosis, want to put in some attention on this, that radiation necrosis is the most worst part of the second uh, radiosurgical situation. You need to just identify that and then you need to decide that how you can treat on that one. The treatment is usually, this is published just now in, this, uh, in the last one, that this systemic review was given by ISRS that the radiation necrosis can be treated with the kind of grading first. You just need to understand at what level the patient is lying. And then you can just offer the treatment in terms of invasive, you go for the surgery. And non-invasive, you can go with the bevacizumab and then afterward the surgery. Uh, these are the cases, so I will skip on that one, that the how you can select for the second radiosurgical doses. And you can just pick up your patient for the better prognosis and you can still have the longer follow-ups and your local, uh, longer survivors. And this is how the last uh, summary of repeat SRS, that you are just moving with the correct diagnosis, use invasive first, or then non-invasive, use first uh, non-invasive and then invasive. This is the paradigm. So at the end, I'll just uh, summarize this. The one to four brain metastasis, good performance, SRS is recommended. For five to 10 brain metastasis, if you have ECOG zero to two, the SRS is conditionally recommended. The multidisciplinary dis uh, discussion actually required for those patients who have large tumor or mass effect. And symptomatic brain metastasis needs local radiation therapy or surgery. Asymptomatic can be deferred for the reason that if you have some better out, uh, systemic therapies, but it requires multidisciplinary input. Unresected or intact brain metastasis, you need to go with the kind of surgery or local therapy. If not eligible, then whole brain radiotherapy. But that needs to be with the kind of hippocampal avoidance or the pharmacological protection. Routine WBRT adjuvant setting is not recommended in all days. Uh, resected every time need radiotherapy and SRS is recommended over WBRT. New adjuvant SRS is another way to treat the intact brain metastasis, uh, brain metastasis to reduce the leptomeningeal diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, I think SRS has come a long way uh, in treating brain metastasis and other lesions as well. So I would uh, request uh, any questions from the audience. Are there any questions? To find out who are the suitable patients for and uh, given it is so freely available now in Pakistan with multiple centers cropping up everywhere I think uh, one needs to be also selective in terms of who you irradiate with SRS if you have a patient who has got uh, liver studded with metastasis 
multiple lung metastasis and at the same time you find up having 10 uh, brain mets being treated you sometimes feel so probably i mean as a group you also need to look at it uh, for a developing country or what is the best use of resources as such and uh, careful patient selection so as a well, if you can uh, simplify it for us who would be an ideal patient for SRS? Uh, does histology play a part? Does his systemic disease play a part? Or uh, is it his uh, financial status which plays a part? Or what, are the th what is most important to you when you select a patient? Uh, so, uh, so financial actually is no more a problem in Pakistan or it is because we have uh, three or four machines in every city who are treating free of cost in Karachi, in Lahore, as well as in Islamabad now. Yeah. So we have a very good distribution for the free treatment. Yeah. Now if we go with the kind of selection, as I said, uh, with good performance status, a uh, limited number of metastases, with the kind of uh, uh, mutational status, is actually the number is one to four. But uh, what we are actually practically, practically the uh, radiosurgical community is using, they are using the volumes. If you are having three, four, five, six, Sorry, uh, but these are very small volumes, less than 10 cc. Can I interrupt because uh, we have to go get on with the next talk. So maybe we can do the discussion. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. So uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Noreen to kindly uh, do her second talk, uh, which is the management of uh, low grade gliomas in children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Um, so, so this is just a small, um, small okay. this is not a very big uh, talk. Um, I try to, you know, make it simple. So it's the updates in the management of like low grade glioma. So we all know, and I previously said that it's the most common pediatric brain tumors, almost like 30 to 40% of all the brain tumor we used to have. It can place at any place in the brain. But the most common areas which um, has the low grade gliomas are the post are the cerebellum, followed by the supracellar area involving the optic path uh, tumors, hypothalamus, then thalamus, brain stem, spinal cord, and then hemispheres. So um, this is a diagram which tells us which type of uh, a low grade glioma exists in the pediatric age group. So it's now uh, divided into like circumscribed, diffuse, other, and mixed in glioneuronal tumors. So if you see the first two to three, these are the most common uh, primary uh, low-grade gliomas, which includes uh, the subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, which are the grade one, pilocytic astrocytoma. We used to have a lot of piloastro in our uh, part of the world, pilomyxoid astros, and pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma in astrocytomas. Make, uh, but do the ple pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas are the one which can be part of the low grade gliomas, while they can be part of a high grade glioma if they are BRAP mutated tumors. Then we have the diffuse astros, oligodendros, low grade. Then um, angiocentric uh, gliomas are part of low grade gliomas, and then the ganglioglomas and the desmoplastic infantile gliomas, papillary glioneuronal tumors. These are all part and parcel of the low grade gliomas we used to have in pediatric age groups. So we all know that the presentation depending on the site. So they, if they have a cerebellar disease, they may present with raised ICT, um, ICP. They may have eye signs, focal neuro neurological deficits, endocrinopathies, diencephalic syndrome, which is not uncommon in our, our part of the world. So the children who have a supracellular low-grade gliomas, they can present with significant failure to thrive. And we are really you know, um, unable to kind of diagnose these patients because we thought that they have a PCM, but actually they are uh, having a suprasalar disease which can cause them significant failure to thrive. So clinical sign and symptoms depend um, on the site, as I told you, but uh, the, the main important thing in the history, you should all remember that these symptoms are usually slowly and gradually evolving. Like if you have a patient who have a very short history, but you think that on the MRI, it's like a low-grade glioma, always consider that as a high-grade rather than a low-grade glioma because usually the low-grade glioma has a very long history or it doesn't present like that it's been two days of history and we think that it's been said that it's low-grade glioma, always, always 
you know, discuss in the tumor boards, discuss in the entities with your neurosurgeons, with your other colleagues who are more seniors to identify these tumors and make a treatment plan. And they may be picked up incidentally on, on screening in some of the patient, like the patient who have NF1 and tuberosis sclerosis. So they can occur at any age. Um, or NF1 patient, they usually do have optic pathogenic gliomas and uh, desmoplastic infantile gliomas at a very early age group. They are associated with NF1, tuberous sclerosis, leaf from many, and at times radiation. I haven't seen a patient with a low grade gliomas after radiation, but that's reported in the literature. And the most important and the most common differential diagnosis used to have with low grade gliomas are the craniums. So most of the time, my colleagues used to ask me, look, this is cranio lag hai, kyunke report hua hai, usme ke ye cranio hai. but always remember, if you're so unsure that what, what type of diagnosis you come across, just do a plain CT scan. If you have a CT, plain CT scan with calcification, that's a craniopharyngioma. But if there is no calcification, mostly they are pilocytic astrocytomas, and they are far more common than craniopharyngiomas in our, part of, uh, in our population. So um, these are, so we have to do a MRI scan, ideally, um, and we should all, you know, kind of, advocate that instead of doing a CT, we have to have an MRI scan with contrast. Never order an MRI in a child without a contrast. Because it is so difficult once they late, jate, so it's always better to have a contrast scan. Uh, so they are usually well de demarcated, although big, because lumbi lumbi history hoti hai aur hamare paas late present karte hai, They usually are iso to hypo in dense on CT without calcification or very minimal calcification. They have cyst, which is frequent in them. In the MRI, the T1 uh, beta image are usually iso intense. T2 are pretty hyper intense, and they show marked contrast enhancement. And leptomeningeal spreads occurs, but very rarely. But you know, this is something many of my colleagues thought, ke, okay, ye to nahi hota. Lekin, we do have our AKU data in which we have um, like five to six cases across nine years of disseminated disease in pilocytic astrocytoma. So it's rare, but and it's like the MRI spine is not part of it. But if you have a patient who have some kind of low-grade glioma, but they show signs and symptoms of the spinal cord involvement, please do um uh, an MRI whole spine as well, but it's not part of the staging workup in low grade gliomas. So pathology, so surgical resection is the key here. So in the biopsy, you usually have biphasic compact and loose areas, pilocytes and resenthal fibers. The main uh, the, the the difficulty is comes when you know you have an inaccessible tumor and the tumors uh, present in the brain stem or children who present with NF1 or with uh, deterioration in the vision in optic pathway gliomas. So that's a complex question. So when to start and where to start and what to do in um, patient of low-grade glioma. So the site is extremely important, the operability, which my neurosurgeons can tell you better, the histology and the behavior. So it's very variable, as I told you. So we should always think that it can be stable for a very long time, can progress at any time, uh, can regress at any time, and we actually have no idea what are the reason of this variability is there in the pediatric low grade gliomas. And then they can behave like a malignant disease if they can present in the brain stem, especially or in the thalamus, if you are unable to uh, resect it out and they can disseminate. So the main issue are not the one that just the surgical resection ho gayi, just the surgical resection ho gayi, achi ho gayi, GTR achi ho gaya. Usme aapko most of the time kuch nahi karna hota. Um, just as cerebellar astros hote. So I'm very privileged to have an excellent neurosurgeons. Ke hamare pas, aaj tak mujhe yad nahi padta ki nine ten saal mein maine kabi posterior fossa cerebellum mein re resection karwai ho. Until uske koi bahut hi issues ho gaye, to kabi hui. Lekin once you have a great resection, it's really, really unlikely to have a recurrence or a progression. But the other problems come out whenever you have an, uh, a low-grade glioma in the suprasalar area, where it's really, really difficult to have a complete resection. And if there is a complete resection, to you, you, you may end up having endocrinopathies, visual problems, and so on and so forth. So it's a betting game that what do you do? Or which treatments is essential in low-grade glioma? Like some of my colleagues may say, ke, okay, but you know, traditionally radiation has been used. 
but why to give an upfront radiation in a population who have an overall survival of more than 95%? You know, there is significant risk of stroke, risk of secondary brain tumors, endocrine deficit, decline in cognition. The main problem is that we don't have the MDTs in various centers. We don't have pediatric people who are dealing with pediatric brain tumors, either radiation oncologists, surgeons, or maybe oncologists. So, you know, wo jo pediatric wali cheez aati ki aapko upar se niche tak dekhna hai ki height kitni effect ho rahi hai, dimaag kitna effect ho raha hai, endocrine kitna effect ho raha hai, wo hum nahi dekhte. Kya uske baad kya ho raha hai, ye bhi nahi hum dekhte. So, this is very, very important before prescribing radiation. So, chemo use hui kab when there is a failure, there was a failure of radiation historically and Syop has started giving radiation back in 1990s uh, chemo uh, in children who are less than five years of age or North America less than 10 years of age, where they were doing radiation. And what are the aims? Aims, we all know that we need a response. We need visual preservation, especially in patients with optic pathic gliomas. We have to delay radiation. In smaller kids, we need to achieve cure survival and to minimize morbidity. The most important factor is to minimize morbidity. So uh, there are some two to three points in which you say, that, okay, in COCAD, so we have to give chemo to this patient. And these are the patient who have a progressive disease following surgical resection based on clear radiological and clinical evidence of progression or incomplete excision with the necessity to begin treatment because they can cause a risk of neurological impairment. So if there is no risk of neurological impairment, do not do anything, just observe those patients. So, but which type of chemo or which type of regimens we used to have? So, historically, the first chemo which used were vincristine back in 1976, followed by our fathers of pediatric neuro-oncology, Dr. Packer's regimen, that's vincristine and actinomycin. But it was not that good. So then in 1993, the most common given uh, chemo was uh, described and that's vincristine and carboplatin, still used very widely in many part of the world. And then multiple uh, chemo has been tried, like in 1997, TPCV has been tried by Petronio and Predos with, with some effects. So this is the COC trials back in 2011, and they basically randomize a carboplatin vincristine versus the TPCV. And it's almost, if you see that the, in the early days, um, the both the regimen shows the same event free survival, but as the time goes, so the event free so the event free survival of TPCV is better, slightly better than the event free survival of the carboplatin and vincristine arm. But you know TPCV is very very toxic. So what happened? So this another drug uh, came, and there was a phase two trial done in two thousand by uh, Eric Buffet and the team. And they have give, started giving vinblastin and what they have uh, in initially in the refractory periodic low grade gliomas, but later on they found out that, you know, while we give uh, vinblastin in the chemo knife patient, they have the same effect as the vincristine carboplatin arm. So, but again, if you see this, so, you know, this is like the progression free survival is, you know, uh, getting poorer and poorer as the time goes. So what happens? So it shows that we need not only one recipe for multiple recipes to make these children better or um, stop the disease. So it's like a chronic disease. So most children will need more than one treatment. So they have a good overall survival, but the event-free survival is not as good as we think that it should have. So many oncologists need to think ahead of the time that if I have a vinblastin, I have to give the next one. So, and or ye sari cheez hum kis mein baat kar rahe the, the tumors who are um, like unresectable tumors. So, it's behave like a chronic disease, like a, maybe a diabetes or things like that. So, on to, to, you know, kind of improve this, you know, we have to see why it behaves like this to predict the need for treatment and can we adjust the treatment accordingly. So there are various biological studies have been done by Ute, Uri. These are all my colleagues, my mentors from SickKids. So they have uh, they have checked various um, elements like microvascular density, um, telomerase length, BRAF activation to see why they're behaving like this. 
So this is uh, an excellent paper. There are multiple papers, but I just selected this one. This is a recent paper by Scott Real, who is a fellow um, uh, at SickKids and the same group, the URI and the others. And what they have done, they have, uh, have uh, around more than 1,000 pediatric low-grade glioma samples, and they integrate the molecular clinical analysis of those patients. So they said that pediatric low-grade gliomas are frequently driven by genetic alterations in the rest and mitogen activation pathway kinase pathways yet uh, show unexplained variability in their clinical outcome. So that's the reason we don't know why some behave aggressively and some not. So it can be broadly classified as on the basis of alteration type, rearrangement driven, and SMV, the single nucleotide variant driven mutations. So somehow the rearrangement driven tumors are better comes in a younger age group and better outcome while as compared to the one with the SNV driven tumors. So these data highlight the biological and the clinical difference between the low grade glioma and opens various avenues for future treatment and refinement. So these are two diagrams. The first one shows the rearranged um, uh, uh, alterated tumors while the other one is the SNV um, uh, tumors. And you know, if you see the outcomes, so the outcomes of these tumors are the overall survival is more than 100%, but you know, if you see this, so, you know, over the time it decreases. So there are some like the FGFR1 who has a poorer outcome, poor even free survival, while if you see this one, the SNV arranged one, the outcome of the BRAV V600D mutant tumors versus the H3K27 are extremely poor. So H3K27 are the one, if even if they have a low-grade glioma, but they have this histone mutation, they behave like a DIPG. So they are usually present in the midline areas. So then in the end, they basically characterize low-grade glioma in the low risk, which includes the NF1, the BRAF fused, not mutant, MIB, uh, MIB L1, FGFR mutations, and the intermediate one are the rest with uh, the BRAF V600E V6, mutation, and the high risk are the one with the histone H3.3K27 mutation because it behaves like in DIPG. And this is the same, like this will tell us the, uh, the risk stratification. If you see the low risk patient are the one whose outcome is not more than 20%. So these are the various targeted therapy which comes across sulimatinib, trimatinib, uh, vimrofenib, dibrafenib for many of the low-grade gliomas. So, um, so these are some papers for giving when people have started giving different targeted therapy for different patients and they have seen significant improvements. So uh, if you don't Resect it. If you have uh, a progressive disease, you can try vimrofenib, you can try surafenib, you can try allotinib, and many of the targeted therapies. So um, mTOR inhibitor, we, we have mTOR inhibitor in Pakistan. Somehow this is the only inhibitor which we uh, are giving to our children very frequently. And these are the children with tuberous sclerosis and with SEGAs. And they usually respond very well with this drug known as Evrolimus. Previously, the drugs used for this are uh, rapamycin and sirolimus. So nowadays, sulimatinib is now part of various, uh, previously it was part of various trials for the ne neurofibromatosis type 1 patients, but now it's an FDA approved for children who have NF1 type of uh, tumors, but it's extremely expensive. So if we give sulimatinib in a 10-year-old girl, the total one month dose cost them 27 lakhs Pakistani rupees is around 600 euros per month. So it's really, really impossible for us to have it here. So then if you still have like a recurrent and progressive low grade gliomas in our setting, we can try radiation at that point in time, not before that, because there are certain uh, first line of agent, weekly when blastin, second line of agent, when Christine Carbo, then carbohydrate followed by irinotecan. But then if still there is a recurrence and progression, you can try uh, radiation and there are multiple metronomal doses which can be given to these patients to improve their outcomes. So this is one of the paper which was um, published last year. That's basically what we have done with the help of our twinning initiative. And then it leads us to, you know, developing guidelines not only under International Society of Pediatric Oncology, but under Pakistan Society of uh, Neuro-Oncology and Pakistan Society of Peds Oncology, 
we have these guidelines in place. So if anybody wants these guidelines, you know, we can share these guidelines to those uh, physicians. So this is the cost estimation I have taken out for my patient when I started, like some may ask why not when Christine Carbo, why when Blastin? So that's a huge difference in when Christine Carbo platin and when Blastin. So when Blastin ke bachche aram sikne school jate, dawai lagwate, koi unko is significant side effects nahi hote, koi febrile neutropenia nahi hote, but when Christine Carbo platin wale bachcho ki dose bhi mehengi hai, inko neutropenia bhi hota hai, hospital admission ki bhi zarurat hoti So you know, that's why and the outcome is almost comparable. So that's why we have included weekly wind blasting as our first line of agent followed by wind Christine Carbo and further therapy. So in the end, low-grade glioma pathogenesis has improved in recent time. The mechanism of action of conventional chemo for pediatric low-grade gliomas is largely unclear, but people are doing a lot and lot of work. Targeted therapy can significantly improve outcomes for the subset of patients. But again, what to do for the LMIC? We don't have funds. We don't have clinical trials. I have to give my child to give my child. So it's a problem that I can't use Dibrafenib, which is a month of one month of one lakh rupee. So the use of targeted molecular therapy remains in infancy, not for us, for the West. And we need current clinical trials um, uh, hospitals, um, uh, centers in which we can start this kind of collaboration to, you know, ask our international colleagues to start these sending these drugs to us on compassionate access programs. So this is all about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are some questions uh, from our online speakers. Do you have anybody online? Uh -huh. so the is there ideal time uh, for second of surgery in spite of Najma in case of residual disease? So, so if you talk about low grade gliomas, if there is a small residual disease and the child is stable, we don't need to do second look surgery. The, the point is that we have to have a proper follow ups and regular follow ups. Uh, and whenever you think that the disease is progressing further, then maybe uh, the right time to kind of have a, a second look surgery. If you have symptoms, hai, so then yes, um, after two weeks' time. Can't see the slides. <laughs> yeah. So in uh, imatinib, so there was there was previous data which uh, showed that imatinib people have tried imatinib and NF one, but somehow and even I tried imatinib for my NF one patient, but uh, unfortunately its role is very very minimal and people and up to so imatinib are the age okay FD approved so essentially हमारे लोगों के लिए शायद हम अपने दिल की तसल्ली के लिए imatinib दे दें कि चलो कुछ है नहीं so imatinib दे दो but my in my experience I have been found uh, a very important role in in uh, NF one patient for him imatinib. Um, so thank you very much to all the speakers and the attendees as well. I think very interesting session. Um, we learned a lot. I'm sure we will learn a lot. Um, so we with this we conclude this session. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. I just have to make an announcement uh, uh, by the organizing committee. Uh, we have a Asana Sheet Memorial Lecture uh, and then prize distribution. So I request uh, all the attendees to kind of make your way there. Thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Arthur and Dr. Noreen and Dr. Azar. I think he left, but uh, thank you. <laughs>